Welcome to a new series on this channel, one that is yet to be named. So if you have any creative ideas, let me know in the comments below. But I guess I need to tell you what this thing's about first. Book reviews. I love doing book reviews. I will continue to do book reviews. But I asked myself the other day, what would it be like to have a conversation with somebody about a particular work of fiction that they are either passionate about, knowledgeable about, or something that has impacted them greatly. What could we unearth that uh, you might not find from a standard review of somebody who's reading it for the first time? That is what this series is going to be. I'm going to bring on people, have conversations about particular books that, like I said, they're passionate about, that has had a massive impact on them in some way. But I'm making sure to keep this open to anybody. So it's not just if you have a YouTube channel or you're a booktuber, or if you even know me, let me know in the comments below if you'd like to chat about a book that you're extremely passionate about. I would love to have you on. But this first episode, this inaugural episode, is going to be covering The Woman in Black by Susan Hill. It's a Victorian novel published way back in the 80s for you young kids out there. And I'm bringing on my good friend and horror author, Matt Evanson, because this is a book that has inspired him that he is incredibly passionate about. One thing I would like to mention before we begin is there will be spoilers because I don't feel like you can dig deep into a work of fiction without exploring the very pivotal moments in the book, which, you know, inevitably will be spoilers. In this conversation, we, we don't only just dive deep into the book itself. We talk about how it's inspired Matt's and his own work how it's impacted him in other regards. But we also talk about Victorian literature. We talk about writing craft. We even talk about the movies. There's two movie adaptations, one of which I've seen. I've not seen the old one from the 80s, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let me know. You know how to do it with a like. And without further ado, here's my uh, conversation about The Woman in Black by Susan Hill with Matt Evanson. Welcome to this first episode of, I don't know what it's called yet. So if you guys have any ideas of what this video series should be called, uh, let me know in the comments below. It's, it's What I wanted to do is, and I'll probably make an intro video, so this will be redundant. But anyway, I wanted to find people who are very passionate about specific books. Maybe it's their favorite book. Maybe it's one of their top five books, whatever it is. But just to create a discussion that really dives deep and hopefully uh, unearths, one might say, a lot of cool tidbits or observations of that. So today we're talking about The Woman in Black by Susan Hill. And so I'm bringing on my good friend and writer, uh, Matt Evanson, and he can pronounce his name the correct way. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. And yeah, it's mostly correct. Mats Evanson. There we go. Uh, yeah. So this is The Woman in Black, the sequel. This is, of course, the book we're going to talk about. It's a bit of a visual gag for all your viewers <laughs> out there. <laughs> um, nice. But I, I guess, she, so I, I should also mention there will be spoilers. We already talked ahead of time off, off recording that we're going to probably bring up the movie, talk about the differences, maybe what was good, what was bad. Um, and so there's going to be definite spoilers here. So uh, you have been warned. Yes. Yeah, it's difficult to talk about this book without getting into. Yeah. Yeah, even light and well both light and deep spoilers i think um okay should i just because we haven't talked this over uh i could just read the back of the book oh you want to read a it. synopsis yeah why not yeah just to get my english uh hi everyone i'm from sweden by the way uh, <laughs> that's why i sound weird um so i'll just read the back of the book people will know uh what kind of book this is Arthur Kipps, a junior solicitor, is summoned to attend the funeral of Mrs. Alice Drablo, the sole inhabitant of Eel Marsh House. The house stands at the end of a causeway, wreathed in fog and mystery. But it is not until he glimpses a wasted young woman dressed all in black at the funeral that a creeping sense of unease begins to take hold, a feeling deepened by the reluctance of the locals to talk of the woman in black and her terrible purpose. Oh, I like the emphasis Very on scary. that. Yeah, so um, I guess let's start with when did you first read this book? Uh, what drew you to it? I'm just curious, like, how was your, what was the discovery process like for you? Mm. So, well, uh, I read the book in 2020, 
So it's uh, recent. fairly recent. Yeah. yeah. And, um, well, we we're going to get into the themes and everything uh, a little bit later. But to me, um, like a book, a great book has to uh, not only be well written, but also have the, the right reader. So uh, this is a book about grief and isolation. And for me at that time, that was the right book. And I was the right reader for that book. Um, you know, pandemic, obviously, big factor there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I've read a bunch of scary novels uh, before, but the woman in black isn't isn't all that scary. Like there are no real jump scares, um, no real like there are no alien level monsters. No. Um, but it's a a book steeped in gothic misery and sorrow and grief, um, and. Yeah, it, it just hit hit me uh, in the right spot at the right time. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I, I never really <clears throat> considered that. You know, sometimes you have to. The book has a, a larger impact on you when you discover it when you need to discover it. You know, yeah, that's 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 a cool way to think about that. Uh, I, I wanted then uh, you brought up that it's not scary, but I would like to bring up that there was the the one part that I found eerie in it was when Arthur was. Moving through the house, he heard the sounds behind the door he couldn't get into. And I really loved uh, the way that Susan Hill uh, crafted that scene. That that was, to me, pretty effective from like a horror standpoint. But yeah, like you said, it's not, there's no big monster. It's not, there's no jump scares. It's not like, um, it's not an intense horror book. Uh, from what I, what I got out of it when I read it very recently um, is that it's like, it's super atmospheric. The pacing of the book was very, it was very slow for the most part. It was very just kind of easing you in, but like just constantly easing you in. And yeah. it was, it was really cool uh, how uh, the atmosphere, it kind of reminded me of like, <laughs> I always talk about Lovecraft um, being my favorite writer, but it's not so much because of his prose. It's more about like the atmosphere he creates or, or the, the mm. mythos he's created and the, the feeling he created for me at the time when I read it as a kid. And I, I got a lot of that out of this book. It just felt like feels very British. feels very, uh, it's very gloomy, foggy, um, just, you know, <laughs> all of those things. But I, I guess I want to start at the beginning because one thing that is, was interesting to me is how it starts on Christmas Eve. So it starts outside of the story, outside of the main story yeah. with the protagonist as an older man, and he's sitting around this room. Everybody's telling spooky stories by the by the fire in the house. And they say, "Hey, what what you know? What's your? You got some great stories for sure." And it, that kind of just triggers this horrible this horrible tragic memory he has of of what he went through. And so then he the rest of the book is about that experience. So what what do you think was the significance of that aspect that that intro that like soft open? Well. Uh Okay, story structure. So for the viewers, I have a whole page of notes here. Uh, so what's interesting is that in Victorian ghost stories, uh, it's very, very common to have a uh, framing device or frame story. Um, and it sets up um, a lot of the first person uh, narrative and it sets up the um, unreliable narrator. Um, yeah, so, um, and because of course, Susan Hill knows all of this. Um, so uh, yeah, because she knows all of this, uh, she decides to write in a first person narrative with a framing device in 
the very traditional Victorian ghost story. Because the book is like a, it's a love letter. It's written in 1983, but it's written in uh, pretty old timey English. Like it's not too difficult to understand. Right. Yeah. I didn't find it too crazy in that regard. No. Um, but there are some things that um, she takes from like the old Victorian ghost stories and other, th other things that she, uh, she uh, takes from modern uh, literature. Mm -hmm. Um what was the question? <laughs> so you're saying that the reason, the significance of that opening scene, rather than throwing the reader into the story, even though it's a first person story, is to kind of just as a framing device. So it's to, yeah, um, to make sure you know, hey, there's this guy. This guy has a story to tell. He's the one who's going to tell it. Let me just set up how we're going to present, you know, that versus starting it from like let's say chapter two where we're yeah. already in his head because a lot of contemporary novels don't even bother with that the framing device it, it's usually just i this i that first person oh is this something he, that this person wrote down is are they are they verbally you know uh telling this story it, it doesn't matter because i think um we're just so accustomed to being comfortable with that that we're not questioning okay well where is this story coming from like who is this story coming from um, yeah and it it also uh, sort of sets mm. it sets the stage uh when we first meet arthur kipps he is in a i actually forget the name of the house he's in but it's a cottage like it's a small house it's not in the city mm -hmm. uh so we hint at we hint as if i wrote it uh <laughs> But Susan Hill hints at the isolation that he, he still feels. Um, so that's a, a great way to set him up, like to show him that he is not, he doesn't really want to be included in, uh, in like, <clears throat> the bigger uh, societal picture. Like right. He has done his... Uh, like, uh, yeah, he's done his part. And very much like the very last line of the book, which mm -hmm. mm, I don't want to spoil it, but like <laughs> he's, he, he's very clear with that. Like, yeah, I've done my part. I'm done with this. Um, and after what he goes through, like no shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, so the first person narrative is uh, a very old, like Victorian ghost story technique, like um, uh, Dracula, for example, is first mm -hmm. person, um, and what else is first person? Oh yeah, Carmilla is also first person uh, narrative, and Frankenstein, is it? No. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember either. Um, I know that the well, there is a framing device in in Frankenstein. Right, when he's on the um, boat, right? No, it's uh, the first three chapters. Uh, is uh, they're told from a completely different point of view. <clears throat> ah. Someone walks by the house and it's like, mm, you know, who used to live there? No, wait. That's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember in Frankenstein, like he's on a ship or something at the beginning. <clears throat> that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, because I was audio booking uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde the other day and realized that, wait, this isn't the original text. This is a uh, uh. more modern text. Um, but yeah, so it is a very common um, technique. Um, and of course, like the, I think the really important thing is that it sets up the unreliable narrator, like, um, instead of us, uh, 
being told uh, from like on high, even yeah, if like it's a, a limited third. Right. Yeah. And even if it's a limited third person, like we're, we're still a bit distant. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a first person narrative, obviously like we are seeing things through, uh, that person's eyes. Right. Yeah. And I find that to be the most effective POV for, for stories like this, I think, um, yeah. ones that are ones that are, you know, um, just a just a more intimate story, like a tighter exploration of of the experiences of one person. You know, I'll bring up Lovecraft again, but ninety nine percent of his stories pretty much are, uh, "Hey, I survived this ordeal. Here's here's my story. I'm in a mental institution, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> you know, usually. Um, and so I, when you're dealing with mental trauma and and like that kind of horror, um, I feel like it's a it's a good it's a good voice for sure. Not to say it can't do it in yeah. third. Like I feel like your book is in third person, so it's and it worked well. So yeah, and we might even get into it, like the many influences of uh, the the woman in black had on on my book. Yeah, Which yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, go check no. it out. The Beast of Saint Ender on Amazon dot com now. Yes, um, but. Um, yeah, and I was gonna say about the the lead up to uh, the scary parts mm -hmm. um, is also very <clears throat> common in Victorian uh, gothic horror. Like, if we look at uh, Dracula, for example, the first chapters or letters that uh, Jonathan Harker sends to Mina is uh, about you know uh, what food. He's eating. Um, he's one of the most boring protagonists ever, Jonathan Harker. But he's like, oh, yes, uh, I found this recipe for borscht uh, that I will ask the proprietor of this uh, inn to. He will send me the recipe and blah, blah, blah. And it's incredibly boring. Um, but, yeah, so you need that long lead up uh, to the really scary part. Um but what's interesting, let's see. Yes, what's interesting is, um, well, there's a lot of things that are interesting with The Woman in Black, but uh, we were talking about Dracula. So let's say that Dracula, the novel, is a 10 on the gothic horror scale. Mm -hmm. And then you take the movie Bram Stoker's Dracula. Is it by Coppola, I think? Uh, yeah, that, that sounds right. One of the big ones, yeah. And the gothic is turned up to 15. Like, it's it's all over the place. It's, it's extreme. It's almost laughable. Mm -hmm. But The Woman in Black, because it's written as a love letter to the gothic horror genre, it's, it's uh, over 10, I would say but it's less than 15. I would say it's an 11 on the gothic horror scale. Um, like it's, it's a bit too much, a bit over the top at times, but she's very good at like uh, not overdoing it. No one is running around in weird uh, Japanese kimonos with big ass hairs. <laughs> um, something I find incredibly strange about that movie yeah yeah the, the the visual design in that film is yeah it's pretty out there yeah even the shadows uh, have uh, lives of their own in the brown stoker dracula movie um but but yeah well one thing that i was going to talk about was uh the modern sensibilities mm -hmm. just that like People might listen to this and hear me talk about this and say, like, oh, my God, this is going to be boring or a tough read. But first of all, it's a very, very thin yeah. book. Uh, it's 47,000 words, I think. Um, uh, so it's a novella if we want to get really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 150-ish pages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, 200 exactly. Oh, uh, well, my my. 
I guess my Kindle copy was listed differently. Yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, when we read uh, like the real deal Victorian ghost stories, uh, so I, I have some visual aids. I don't know if that's going to show up in the in the camera, but uh, we're going to try it anyway. So this is uh, the Oxford Book of Gothic Tales. <clears throat> I'm surprised so, you didn't like blow dust off it, <laughs> like they always do in no, the movies. No, no, it, it's, it's, it's very well read. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I've noticed when reading like old timey uh, stories is that um, like paragraphs are always very long yes. or not always but they don't really do the <clears throat> the academic idea of one thought per paragraph it's 105 ideas per paragraph so i, I just wanted to show this um this story from 17 i believe 1776 or 1773 yeah, yeah, yeah. okay so it starts here, of course, it's not. Oh, that's one paragraph. I can barely see. I think you can see the white space yeah. So, and it, that there is yeah. none. That's a paragraph. And that paragraph just continues. <laughs> Looks like lorem ipsum. That's crazy. Yeah. And then the Whoa. story ends. It's just one long paragraph. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's something um, I've never seen before. I did notice in um, in this book, in The Woman in Black, though, that there wasn't a lot of, you know, like in contemporary writing, like you're mentioning, a lot of um, paragraph breaks for effect or anything like that. It was very long paragraph. Not like that long, but definitely. But to me, that kind of writing always facilitates your you getting just immersed slowly like sinking like quicksand or in a bog in this yeah. case right like into the prose which was um it was effective it was definitely effective and it um it's one of those things i don't think most readers think about and hopefully they're experiencing it i would imagine they are experiencing the effects of of how a book is written but um it's cool when you start studying writing and, and you learn all this stuff and you're like oh wow it's yeah. it's not just what the story is telling you, but it's how the words are arranged on the page is important too. Yeah. That, uh, that makes me think, well, I'm going to shoehorn what I think. Uh, so when we talk about like modern writing and mm -hmm. when we look at like, uh, people on YouTube uh, explaining how to write character descriptions, mm -hmm. uh, it's often like, uh, and I know that we have talked about this, and I know that you and I uh, use this technique. Uh, it's that we don't uh, bring up anything that is irrelevant to the story. So if we can't shoehorn in a description, mm -hmm. like he tossed his brown hair, um, then we're not gonna we're right. not gonna stop the action just to describe someone. Correct. Yeah. So. The woman in black. Her description starts here. This is her description. Now you're thinking, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. And it just continues. Yeah. Her description is two pages long. Wow. And I think that's well, first of all, I think it's really cool that she actually does stop the action because she's confident that she can get away with that. But it's also, uh, it's, it's important. Uh, it's an important lesson that, uh, she stops the action because this character is so important. Mm -hmm. So she takes that time because if, if we just describe her as a woman in black and nothing else, then you don't really see her in front of you. Yeah. Is that the you moment to like yeah. in the church? Oh, in the church. Right. During the funeral, right. Yeah. When he's attending the funeral. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. Cause, um, that's, that's the only time I remember her being, you know, de described in detail. Mm. But yeah, this book yeah. doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really pick up 
for a while, almost like halfway in ish, I think, because Arthur, he goes, you know, he's yeah. sent on this mission to deal with her paperwork because this woman, Drablo, has died. And so he goes to this town, starts hanging out, talking to people, then he eventually goes to the house and then nothing really happens for quite some time. So it it it, it was, even though it is a short book and novella, um, it does you know, take a little bit of time to get into things. Although the first mm-hmm. kind of eerie thing you do see is the woman in black at the, uh, at the church because she's yeah. described like a, almost like a cadaver, like her skin, like no yeah. fat. And she has some kind of health condition. So I think somebody says that where it's just sucking the skin up against her skull. And um, so that I guess technically is, is kind of a, a creepier moment in, in the story, even though it's, more or less in broad daylight as opposed to in some creepy haunted house somewhere. Yeah. One of the interesting things uh, is uh, is that when he describes her and when he thinks about her later in the novel, uh, he thinks of her as a real woman of flesh and blood. He doesn't think of her as uh, the, a traditional ghost, like, mm-hmm. you know, semi-transparent. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Like, ooh, like that. yeah, like ethereal or something. Yeah. yeah. But she's an actual woman, which is very, very interesting, I think. I didn't pick that up. That's that's cool because I I like that. I mean, it's it's almost. It's, it's scarier because it's it's like there exists. And I guess there's there's two prongs to it. There's either. You fear something that is ethereal because it can, you know, maybe move through walls and there's no hiding from it. But then also the physicality of something like that is pretty creepy if they're flat, you know, yeah. flesh because it's just it feels more tangible. Yeah. And uh, it should also be noted that she the woman in black. Uh, the woman in black, uh, Janet, she died in. 1901 so about four years before the events of the book um so she is not like this ancient like ghost from past generations 100 years old Mm -hmm. it's not like the headless horseman of harry potter fame uh, and i guess uh, sleepy hollow fame uh, who's um, long dead, but she's only been dead for like four or five years. Um, so she is, she, the thing is that she might not be dead is the thing. She might not be dead. She's described as not an old woman. Right. And she is, um, I think she was born in 70 or like late 1860s. So she's middle-aged at the time of the novel. So we can't really be sure if she is this ghost. Because what does she actually do? And let's get into spoilers, listeners. Uh <laughs> What does she actually do? The only thing she actually does is she scares the horse at the end of the novel. Yeah, that's true. She doesn't do anything else. Like in the movie, like in the 2012 uh, adaptation, she coerces children into burning themselves and whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, prologue, they jump uh, out of the window. But that's not in the book. Right. Um, so she's sort of vaguely uh, around when weird things happen. But she might not actually be a ghost. And the only reason we think that she's a ghost is because Arthur Kipps is telling us that ah. he kind of thinks she's a ghost. And then, of course... There is a supernatural force involved because he he hears uh, the sound of the pony and trap, mm-hmm. um, and that's weird. Right. I'm not saying that that's not supernatural. 
and I'm not even saying that she's not uh, some sort of supernatural entity, but we don't know is the thing. We can't be absolutely certain that she is uh, this this weird ghost. And of course, uh, at her funeral, or at Alice's funeral, uh, when when Arthur uh, sees that um, she's standing over there, and he's turning around, and then he looks at the kids who are standing outside the, um, the enclosure, and they're, they are all looking at her. They're staring at the woman in black. But the thing is that if you look at the, wo the woman in black, you'll die, or something really bad will happen to you, you or someone you love. Mm -hmm. At least that's the case in the movie. Right. But it's it's not explained as well in the or as explicit in the novel. Yeah, it would seem to be almost like <clears throat> when she shows up, that's in the book, right? When she makes herself, you know, a, you know, right? Wasn't that it? Kind of like when she's around, <laughs> that's when yeah. a sign of bad things are going to happen, if I remember correctly. Sure. But I mean, okay. it's a <clears throat> shitty small village. Everyone is around. <laughs> yeah, that's when true. everything happens. Um, and I'm not. I'm not really saying that she. She might not be a ghost. She is fairly obviously a ghost, but it's not a hundred percent certain. Uh, that's cool. So was that? I, I stop you real quick. Was that something that you picked up as an observation, or was that something you know? And once you read it, and you were kind of looking more into it, that you saw somebody mention that that kind of very specific element. I think I started thinking about that when I watched the 1989 adaptation. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, which is the BBC adaptation. Um, and it's very clearly a TV production. And it's just a lady in makeup. Right. Um, and you've seen the mm -hmm. screenshots um, or screen caps. But... Um, but yeah, uh, she's just standing there. It's just a, a lady who's super sad. Um, and that's when I started thinking, wait, maybe she isn't an actual ghost. Uh, I mean, they say she's been dead for four, maybe five years. Um, but who knows? Maybe she's living in a cottage, uh, you know, somewhere in the woods. Um, watching uh, people around her or, well, in the village, like, she enjoys uh, that they fear her. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Well, okay, that's cool. I was just curious if that was something that hit you while you were reading the book, but it sounds like it was the visual representation, possibly yeah. due to technical technological limitations in the film. That yeah, really started because she's green <laughs> in the BBC adaptation. Yeah, and then you went back to the book and you're like, wait a minute, yeah, she's not yeah. described in this ghostly form. So that's that's really cool. Um, another thing I really thought was cool about the book was the naming conventions of the places. So we have Eel House Manor, and then the Causeway. Marsh this House. is another oh Marsh House. Yeah, then the, the there's the Causeway right called like the Nine Lives Causeway, yep. which is really cool. And so for those of you who are just spoiling yourselves to death right now and have never read the book or seen the movie, um, there's this causeway that links the house to, I guess, the mainland. And then the tides go up and down as tides do. And so essentially you're trapped after a certain part of the day. And I thought that was a really cool uh, element of horror to where, OK, because, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of times you're 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 like, oh, why don't they just run away? Well, in this case, she solved that problem by like, well, the waters rise and you can't, yeah. you are stuck here. And so I thought that was a really uh, brilliant way yeah. to, to keep Arthur where she needed him to be. And, and also the reader to make them feel trapped. Imagine another book uses a causeway <laughs> to. Uh, yeah, and, there is a causeway in that book. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the causeway in itself is so interesting and cool <coughs> because what, uh, and I am still baffled and in awe of Susan Hill for this. So let's get into the main themes 
of uh, the story because otherwise this whole causeway thing isn't going to make any sense. So obviously it's a horror novel. So um, the main umbrella theme is fear. That's what horror is about. Um, but this book is uh, the main theme is sorrow, as I've said before. Everyone is grieving in this book. Arthur will be. Um, the woman in black is grieving. The entire village is grieving their children, etc., etc. Uh, so grief is the big one. And of course, what happens on the causeway? Grief, or rather, tragedy strikes. That's where uh, I believe his name is Jonathan. No, uh, Nathaniel, uh, the woman in black's son. Mm -hmm. That's where he dies. That's where tragedy strikes. Uh, the other big theme is isolation. Everyone is isolated. The village is isolated. Ilmarsh House is isolated. You have to get, uh, you have to use the causeway to get to the house. Um, Arthur Kipps is isolated when he's there uh, and in the framing story and of course the woman in black is isolated in her grief and misery and the causeway represents isolation um, so the causeway represents two of the main themes in this book, which is amazing. And of course, the causeway was built by the Romans, um, so it's ancient. And that's when we get to the third theme of the novel, which is uh, the past's influence on the present. Uh, Arthur Kipps uh, has to rifle through someone's memories, um, the woman in black. Obviously, she can't let go of the past. And as we find out, um, Arthur can't let go of the past either. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so the causeway is, even though it's just a road, mm -hmm. it still represents uh, all the major themes in the novel. I mean, how flipping brilliant is that? That, that is. That's amazing. Yep. Like, head exploding, flat cap, debris flying everywhere. When um, did that one hit you? Uh, I don't know. I think I had to Google it. <laughs> so the internet helps you. <laughs> helped, helped guide yeah. your hand, yeah. No, that's oh, cool. Like, uh, actually, I, I didn't actually uh, I didn't see any connections between the causeway and the major themes, but I sort of realized that oh yeah, what's happening on the causeway? Well, there's the marsh and the pony and trap and everything, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, because I've I've used a uh, causeway in my own novel, I sort of vaguely aware of what they m may or may not represent. I think in my novel, I describe the island where everything is uh, happening. It's anchored like a balloon with uh, the causeway. And it's very easy for the for a balloon. It's very easy to let go of that piece of string. Like, and the, the balloon can fly away and be lost forever and blah, 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 blah. Um, but yeah, I think it's a. I think that's just an amazing thing for uh, Susan Hill to have done. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, has there? Have I seen a horror movie or read a horror novel where, like, something so, I guess, mundane or everyday-ish? still represents all of that that she's writing about 
I don't think so. I think most horror novels, and I talk about this and when I, when I read that book, The Hole, is that most horror novels don't, I don't know, I don't feel like they're considering those kinds of things. To me, those are more literary yeah. things. I think theme and all of that stuff should exist, honestly, in any genre. It doesn't have to, but I, I feel like you're only going to strengthen the story and the characters and everything. You know, it's going to feel more cohesive and more powerful. But yeah, I would be willing to bet that, you know, if you're reading a Stephen King novel or if you're reading a um, uh, Bentley Little or even Adam Neville or any of those, I doubt I doubt they're really going that deep. At least maybe every once in a while they might have a novel that they really, you know, they're super passionate about or they have something to say maybe in that regard. But yeah, that's a good point. That is something I didn't um, I didn't pick up. But yeah, it's 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 great when there's so many layers like that to a book. And um, yes, and I, I just have to like uh, cut in uh, again rudely um, <laughs> and just say that like imagine any Cabin in the Woods movie. We've seen 150 of those. Imagine if the road to the cabin represented the entire story. That has never happened. <laughs> that has never, ever happened. It's just a road. But Susan Hill manages to take all of the important aspects of the novel and put it in this road, mm -hmm. which is, I think it's crazy. I think it's amazing. And I'm curious, uh, you know, there, there's just something I talk about often, and that's author intent versus um, things that readers extrapolate from things. So I'd be curious to know if Susan Hill herself, again, a lot of the stuff could be subconscious. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. um, who've spoken about this as well, um, is that a lot of times when you're writing, uh, even though, let's say, uh, the, the writer didn't consciously put that there, there could be a subconscious element because... A lot of when we write, we're kind of assembling this puzzle in the back of our mind. And it's not sure we're not consciously aware of it all the time. And sometimes you go back and you're, you're reading some of your own work or another book and you're like, oh, weird. Like I can see a connection there. And because mm. we are just wired to find meaning in patterns and, you know, that, so that's so we're always looking for it. And I think that's a that's an important thing. But also. <laughs> I don't think it matters. I don't think even if that wasn't her intention, like her conscious intention, it doesn't matter. Maybe she subconsciously did it, or maybe that's just something that the readers put together. And in which case, that's I think that's pretty cool still. Yeah, actually, I do think it's it's intentional uh, because I've never read a, a horror novel with uh, a causeway in it before. Uh, the woman in black and i think that as a horror writer and a horror reader i know that the easier uh, alternative is to uh, like put the setting somewhere isolated you know out in the moors or you know on a mountain or wherever where it's isolated but to uh, have an island of some sort that's it's kind of strange because the island in this novel isn't mentioned by name i don't think it's I just the, either yeah it's just the uh, the house um but yeah it's a it's an extra step to have it set on an island with a causeway uh so i do think it's intentional but okay. I don't know. Yeah, I'm we, not we, her. yeah, we'll never know unless we were to to ask her personally. But I again, I, I think it. I'm of the <laughs> the the mindset that it doesn't matter. I, I think that it Very honestly, true. it would be really cool if she's like, "You figured it out." But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but ring ring. <gasps> yeah. Um, but Hello, Susan. <laughs> yes. Speed dial. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. I know we've had this discussion on my Discord server about with other people there saying how it is important to them that the author intended certain things and that those things are um, digestible, you know, in the book um, versus, oh, you're just 
you're just putting things together that don't exist and, and, and ascribing meaning to something. But I don't know. I, I remember reading, uh, it was a, uh, this is going to date me, but uh, Chris Cornell interview, uh, who was the, the late, great Chris Cornell from the Soundgarden band. But uh, somebody yeah. was at, he, he was very known for poetic writing. So his lyrics were very poetic. They weren't literal. And somebody asked him once about that, like, you know, what, what does this mean? He's like, it's not, it's not my job to tell you what it means. It's the listener's job to tell me what it means. And so you can just Absolutely. extend that, you know, extend that to books, even though books are, you know, more literal, we're trying to paint pictures in people's heads and create vivid characters. Um, all of the subtext, all of the, the foundational bedrock, bedrock that exists there, that a lot, that's for a lot of the readers to pull, too. Not to say yeah. a writer can't create that foundation, but I think that um, it's, it's up to the readers, careful readers anyway, to, to do that. And I, I don't think that's, um, they're wrong. I don't think that they'd be wrong to come up with some conclusion. I mean, the internet is full of these things, right? These conspiracy yeah. theories and hidden meanings and stuff. It's funny. First of all, it's funny because I listened to Audio Slave yesterday, uh, Like a Stone which is a, an incredibly, it's a very, very sad song, and it's also incredibly poetic. Yeah. I was like, yes, this is good. Uh, I was belting it out of my uh, bedroom window. I'm sure oh, the neighbors. Yeah, fuck the neighbors. Anyway, um, no, that is true. But as a writer yourself, uh, like you know that, when we read stuff and, well, when we perceive reality, basically. Oh, yeah, the big words. <laughs> uh, when we perceive reality, we get inspired, and that finds it, its way into our writing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think that, like, for example, when I name my characters, they always have very meaningful names. Yep, But Same. Yeah. But they might not mean the same to me as they mean to you, so their meanings will change. And um, yeah, your interpretation of my writing um, is as important, I think, as as my writing. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. But basically, that I, I think that uh, Susan Hill was very, um, yeah, she must have used the causeway and the little island for a reason. Because um, she specifically mentions that the Romans built it, right? Like it's a, I don't remember. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I think lines get blurry, man. No, I know. I'm just I wondering. Did, uh, <laughs> a bit of research on causeways ah, uh, when okay. I wrote my novel. So I know that the Romans were the ones gotcha. uh, building them. Um, yeah, so, I mean, really, uh, thematically, that's what the causeway potentially represents. But then also, it's it's not just doing one thing. It's not, well, it's doing, I guess, three things technically. It's doing uh, the, the, uh, the thematic underpinnings of one of the themes of the novel, but also a way for the character to get to the house, but then also a way for that character to be trapped and yeah. isolated. And you mentioned earlier that isolation is a big part of the, you know, the themes. So yeah, it's, it's cool. It's uh, it's, I don't know. I think that's what I think I, I always say this too, but I, I love short books because it gives you so much time to do these things and focus on these details. Whereas if you have, um, too much of a sprawling story. I think that the the writer is so concerned with okay, how do I hook up all these plot lines and all these characters, and they're not always thinking about that crucial, um, you know, subtext really. Yeah, it's and easy I, to get lost in yeah. in the story when you're writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, absolutely, and. Um, I mean, I, I sat down to write a story last November. I think I've written the same stupid story now three times, and it never ends up the way I wanted to. Like, because we get lost, we read uh, 
like we get influenced by other novels or other movies or other life experiences. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what would you say yeah. is, is the most, I guess, the most memorable, most impactful moment of the novel for you? Uh, the end. Okay. Like the last, whatever page, I think. Should we spoil um, it for the viewers and talk briefly about I the... I think you uh, already the, have, right? Yeah, I guess we have, yeah. Briefly, uh, I think you talked about how she shows up and scares a horse, but we haven't oh yeah, we, haven't, we haven't really talked about the, uh, the, the twist of the dagger, one might say, uh, that is the ending of this book. Yeah. And that's... Actually, we were... Yeah, we're going to have to talk about... Yeah, yeah we will. Okay, ending. well, okay. Spoiler, okay. I'll try to make chapter selections and I'll put little spoilers so you guys will know. But I am very All right, sorry, so, Reaper, but <laughs> let us uh, yeah, tell yeah. us about the the ending of The Woman in Black. So the last chapter of the novel is called The Woman in Black. And it's set uh I think a few years a few years after the events of the book. And Arthur Kipps and his uh wife and child is uh they're in a park mm -hmm. and uh the wife and child gets on a um horse and buggy and suddenly um the woman in black shows up the horse rears up and sort of lands on i don't know maybe i'm making that up a tree, I think they were thrown out. Oh no, the baby or the the baby hits a tree, I think. Yeah, um, and the child dies, mm -hmm. and his wife dies. Later, yeah, sometime later, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're sitting there, like stunned by that whiplash of an ending. Mm -hmm. Um. Which is another really, really cool aspect of of uh, the novel is that there's no like in a in a traditionally told story you'd have like a big finale at the end, but this isn't a big finale at all. This is a whiplash after a false ending, mm -hmm. um, which is. Another really cool, like if we want to talk like a story structure, um, it's another really cool aspect. It shows that you don't have to have that final battle at the end of yeah, the, the story. Yeah, the, just for the you viewers. Sort of, oh, and then... <laughs> yeah, just for the sake of the viewers, I guess, who haven't read it and love to get continually get spoiled because you're, you're in pretty deep right now, yeah. is that, uh, yeah, the way the book, you know, the soft ending, as you're talking about... Um, he just kind of like leaves. There, there's not really, yeah. there's not really any conclusion. So you're left wondering, okay, I mean, what, what is she trying to say with this? And then, yeah, you get sucker punched at the very end with yeah. uh, a dead baby. Uh, so, yeah. and I think another thing I really Brilliant. enjoy, a, what? Brilliant. Brilliant. It's... No, it, it, it's a great ending. It's a super, I mean, I, I love tragic endings. I know not everybody does. And I, I can understand how somebody might read this and be like, I hate this book. They kill the baby yeah. right at the very end. But another thing that's great about the ending, the last line and the line leading up to it in that, so we're kind of immersed in the story at this point. Um, we're, we're reading it less like, someone's telling us a story or we're reading a story written by somebody else. And I feel like we're really experiencing the, the story, but what yeah. Arthur Kipps does at the end, because he is documenting this, he pulls himself back and he's almost talking to you basically said, I've, to I've told this I'm done, you know, and then the final word. Um, and so it's, it's like he, you start far back where you're in that, that framing scene at, at Christmas Eve or whatever it is. And then you dip into the story, and so then you're immersed in the story. And the very end is like, whoosh, he pulls back for a second. And you realize yeah. that he's the man writing the story. It's fucking him up, you know, especially at the very end because he's having to relive the most traumatic event of the entire book. And uh, I, I, it was cool. It was a cool, like, 
you know, bird's eye in a way and then zoom down and then like bird's eye really quick at the end. And you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. And so you can see it's Arthur a, sitting there just, you know, breaking his pen or whatever he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I guess that we might talk a little bit about the uh, the adaptations. Sure. Uh, so the uh, the eighteen nine the nineteen eighteen nine adaptation uh, is very faithful to the book, except for some reason the uh, the protagonist is Arthur Kidd, not yeah. Arthur Gibbs, <laughs> which is just pointless. I don't understand. I'm the only reason I can think of is that oh yes we need to. Uh, sort of relate him to to children, children. because, like, what? Yeah, I can't be it. It's his, so stupid. His last name is um, Kid, <laughs> of course. Yeah, see the connection, and that's why she follows him to uh, back to London and <laughs> s- starts killing people. Um, I mean, it, it's a it's so so stupid, and um, well, in the end of that book. The kid drowns in a lake instead. Um, but in the 2012 novel, uh, there's a sort of happy, sappy ending, yeah, which misses the point entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen the 2012 uh, adaptation with Daniel Gandalf Radcliffe, um you will um you'll get a very atmospheric and lovely movie but it like the main well it shares themes but it doesn't have that snappy like one of the main points of the the novel is him going from being a sort of a happy ambitious lad uh, to this miserable old man, mm-hmm. and the movie misses that point completely. Yeah. Um, you know what else I I missed in the 2012 in the in the movie is I liked the dog. So there's a little dog in the book named Spider. Mm. Yes. And Spider is sent. Uh, I think what was his name? Um, Daily was that his name? The guy yeah. who owns the dog. And mm-hmm. he sends him along. He's like, hey, I'll keep you company in this spooky house. And uh, the dog obviously starts hearing things, as dogs do in horror movies, and going off and chasing these weird apparitions. And uh, eventually the dog ends up uh, running into the, the swamp or the bog. And Arthur has to go out and, and save the dog. Barely saves him, risks his own life. But in the movie, the dog's there. I don't think the dog's ever named. I, I could be wrong, but... He's just kind of riding around with this guy who's who's taking him to the house over the causeway. And so the dog itself, while it's present in the film, never plays any kind of narrative part whatsoever, which was kind of no. unfortunate. Yeah. Plus his Spider. name Spider, which is a it's a it's a yeah. um, I remember that was the chapter heading uh, for when we're introduced <laughs> to the dog as well. And you're like, oh, Spider, what is this going to mean? Oh, it's a yeah, dog. it's a little terrier dog. <laughs> yeah. And. I mean the the 2012 movie also has that uh, that story where Mr. Daly's wife sort of communes with the dead or something. Oh she, yeah, she's yeah. She's crawling she ha- the wall of a chapel and stuff. And, and the and the tomb or whatever. She's yeah scrolling. Yeah. yeah, that was because her child had been uh, died. They they definitely are killed. They they definitely lean into the uh the children aspect a lot more in the uh in the film than the book i felt yeah yeah oh yeah also mr daly is played by kiernan Hines. another game of thrones alumni yeah yeah i I knew you (laughs) king of the north yes man's raider um Mm -hmm. The most clean-cut King of the North I've ever seen in the history of cinema, I have to say. That was, <laughs> I was like, why did yeah. this guy grow a beard or something for this role already? It's uh, Karen Hines. <laughs> he, 
I bet he just went. I'm not putting on a yeah, fake beard. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I thought too. He's like, you got no. me dressed up in like leather and all this shit, and I'm sweating my balls off. I'm yeah. not getting uh, a beard yeah. as well. Yeah. Um. But yeah, and I think also uh, a problem with the 2012 movie is that uh, if we look at the production companies involved. Uh, Filmy Vest, among others. It's a European uh, co-production. Uh, there are too many production companies is the problem. There are too many uh, cooks with their in greasy the little hands. Yeah. In the, yeah. And it, it's a real problem, I think. Uh, like, why does he have to die at the end? Why, why is this big sacrifice that he's making? Like, what's the point of that? To yeah. show that he's a good guy? I mean, we already know he's the good guy. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it doesn't... It, it, the, the whole point is, in the novel, is that even though he tries to set things right for the woman in black she still fucks him up. Like, you can't... Uh, like, in, in a traditional ghost story, many times the ghost needs you, the protagonist, to set their affairs uh, straight. Right? You, they have unfinished business. So Arthur Kipps goes out and finishes her business. She doesn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. And which is uh, a very, very cool aspect of this, of the novel mm -hmm. is that she's not just going, oh, yes, I can now rest peacefully. Thank right. you very much. Right. Thank you. You know, she, she's like, yeah, that's all nice and everything, but still gonna still take gonna you get down. You. Yeah. What really yeah. reminded me of it is that uh, the Ring remake, the American remake from, I think, 2002 or something, where. Yeah they uh they try to quote unquote put her to rest and then the boy's like what did you do what the hell did you do and then it just kind of pulls the rug from out you know out from under you and it's like no she's just this evil little girl and she doesn't want to be put to rest she's always been evil and terrible and there is no goodness yeah. in her heart and you're screwed and so i i i really love it when uh books and and movies take a, a very common horror trope and just turn it on its head that's pretty exciting yeah. for me but uh so then the the movie when the movie doesn't understand that that's one of the key points it's mm, it's so bad yeah it's the problem because i love the movie up until that point i think the movie but has a lot more drive which doesn't surprise me yeah. because they got a script writer involved and like okay we got to be as efficient as we can we got to push the story along they even kind of made um arthur a more proactive character, I felt like a more, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say heroic, but you know, for lack of a better word, like he's pushing forward, he's trying to do things. And the book, he's not so much that way. Um, no, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine like Daniel Radcliffe reading the novel and being like, wait, so I end up like in bed, and that's it, that's what I do, that's my heroic effort. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. Take me out into the bog. I'm gonna dig up uh, an old skeleton. Yeah, it's like blah, here's blah. the thing: like, why wouldn't they do that when the tide was low? Because we saw the cross plenty of times. Makes no sense. <laughs> and uh, rather than just yeah. grabbing the boy's body and being pulled up, he's like, "No, let me let me attach this rope to this trap." So the car has to pull the entire thing out of the mud. I was like, "This makes yeah. no sense." Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just a, like a, a set piece to yeah, exactly. uh, to have something scary happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's incredibly stupid. But I think what the movie gets uh, correct is like the the gothic vibe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we've said that already, but uh, like up until it it becomes stupid, it's actually. Like very atmospheric, mm -hmm. um, and everything looks like you would think that it looks. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, Until it goes full Hollywood, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's so shitty about the movie is that it's not Hollywood. It's Europe trying to be Hollywood. Yep. Which is... Like, it's it, tragic. I, I've noticed that with a lot yeah. of movies and TV shows now where uh, I, I watch a lot of foreign stuff and you'll watch a movie and you're like, oh no, they're trying to be American blockbusters. Shit. Yeah. That's exactly why I watch horror or foreign films is because to not have the American blockbuster. Yeah. I even, in my book, The Beast of St. Tender, available now. <laughs> I don't know why I'm pointing. There's the camera. Uh, there is a, uh, he's got, well, fuck it, I'm going to spoil my book too. But in the end, he's fighting someone. The lead character is fighting someone, and uh, he sees his dead wife come at him. And she's like, come with, uh, come with uh, me, I think she says, something like that. Not in that horrible English accent. <laughs> that will sound right like now, an Italian accent. Come with a bee. Come with me. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and he goes, oh, yeah, I should go with her. And then he goes, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's a direct reference to the 2012 Woman in Black movie. <laughs> or, that's a response, I just wish yeah. that Arthur Kipps went like, mm, no, actually, I have stuff to do in the real world. I'm yeah. not going to step into the light. Well, so... Gotta, the how how would I guess how would you have ended the film? Like let's say uh, the film is exactly how it is, up until that end point where his kid, for whatever reason, falls into the onto the railroad tracks and he's got to jump in and save him. Would you have just had him go back and uh, I don't know, kind of? I think what what I would have done is I would have given them the big ending, or like they set things right. Like they bury uh, Nathaniel the son, and uh, they bury uh, they bury the woman in black, and they all get to be buried together. Like in the mm -hmm. movie, they drop him off in the kid's bedroom. <laughs> like, yeah, we're just gonna leave him on the bed. Yeah. Like why? He's. We're gonna tear down the house in a week. We're selling the house in a week. Like. That's not a final resting place. <laughs> uh, I mean, dig a grave. You, you know where all the where all their uh, the family's graves are. Like, you could have just dug a grave instead. He doesn't, um, because they have to be in the house. They have to be scary. Mm. But anyway, I would have buried the kid and her, and they would have been. Uh, they would have been together, mm -hmm. and then several years later, bam! You hit them with the the whiplash. The okay. Yeah. Okay. So then Arthur would have, his his kid would you have know, died, and Arthur would have just been there to just ball his eyes out or whatever. Yeah, I think like uh, when Arthur goes to do the right thing, you're thinking, "Oh yeah, he's a good guy," so nothing bad can happen to him mm -hmm. in the last three minutes of the movie mm -hmm. well actually they can um yeah, yeah it could, so it, like kill his kid in the last uh, minute of the movie <laughs> do you think you would have still had um a scene would you think you would leave arthur just and just cut it right there like his kid dies and that's it and he's just cut to black or do you think you'd do something where yeah. you would show the ghostly wife and the son being reunited, but Arthur is separate. No. No? Okay. Fuck all of that. No, I'm just curious. I'm uh, curious how far you would take it from the movie versus... Um, oh, yeah. There would be no women in light uh, stuff <laughs> like that. No way. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. No, the ending of that movie is just third act in fact could just be removed yeah um yeah i mean the the problem with the the 1989 adaptation is that it's set first of all it's set in 1925 so it's not victorian horror right at all um 
and it's a uh, very much a TV production. And it's shot in broad daylight for some reason, like <laughs> the scariest, spookiest time. Um, yeah, so everything is very evenly lit and uh, not very scary. Um, but um, but yeah, they they do understand uh, more of the the point of the of the story. I wish. I wish they could have transferred the 89 adaptation onto like given it the 2012 budget mm. and like uh gothic creative uh, eye. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, like, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um but yeah, uh Yeah. Uh, so that's what I think of uh, the movie. <laughs> uh, the book, I mean, I mean, uh, the book, yes, hello, hi. Um, yeah, and then, of course, there's uh, uh, The Woman in Black, the awful, awful sequel, which which doesn't understand, like, its predecessor whatsoever. Because that it's is a just... novelization of the film, right? That's not... Oh, yeah, so this is... Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the Woman in Black, the sequel... Oh my Thank God! You. It even says it Angel there. of Death, yeah. uh, and it's uh, yeah. So the sequel is set in 1940. Um, the house is being used as a sort of uh, bomb shelter, or not bomb shelter, uh, but a sanctuary for a children who has lost their parents in the war. Mm. Uh, and it's garbage. Don't watch it. Um, but what's so embarrassing, and I really feel embarrassed for Susan Hill, is that when you go on Amazon and you uh, look at uh, The Woman in Black, it says that this is part of a series. Oh, man. And like they're together, and there's a little plus sign here. Like, want to buy these two books together? Want to have your life ruined? Um and I mean, I'm sure she got money for the sequel, but as a writer, Potentially. I'm like feeling, yeah, mm, it doesn't just, feel good at all. Yeah, no, I th I think that's the, the the thing about you know when when writers you know they get published traditionally you you're giving away the property, they're giving you money in exchange for owning the rights to your stuff, and you're pretty much having yeah. a say unless you have some kind of fancy contract. So I can't imagine she's happy about it but um she's been writing a lot of other detective novels too right yes i haven't read any of her other stuff i'm surprised uh me too but <laughs> the reason is because i don't think that she can top the woman in black. i don't think that she can top the woman in black yeah. and i would rather believe uh that all her books are as great as the woman in <laughs> black then find out that they're not um yeah like it's such a perfect little story that i don't want to yeah. ruin like my perception of her uh and um yeah i i, I don't want to do that uh yeah. i don't want to ruin my perception of her exactly. interesting um yeah I, I mean for what it's worth i, I did uh I was curious what else she's been working on and what she's written, and I and I discovered that it's it's something like a fifteen book series so far, or something like that, and it's a detective series. Yeah. Right? I think it's a female protagonist, if I remember correctly. And I don't know; they have great reviews. So she's written children children's books as well. Oh, okay. Um, and she's written like twenty five, thirty books. Wow! I think, I think she's crazy. got like two series of uh, of books. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's a folklorist. Mm. Like she's a scholar. She's uh, like she's very clearly, deeply invested in in that one story. And I think it was her first. I mean, I I don't actually know if it, if it was her first, but like she gave it her all. In, yeah. In that story. Yeah, you can tell every once in a while you read a novel from an author, and you're like, okay, this is their, this is where their, they, their guts were on the table, basically, you know, or on the keyboard, yeah. so to speak. 
and, and you can really, you can really feel it. And, um, yeah, I, I wish there were more books like this. I wish there were more like these nice little, just tightly written, you know, not trying to hit arbitrary word counts to, you know, fit a genre expectation or, you know, even this ending, the ending to me was extremely risky, but that's the kind of stuff I appreciate. I, I don't want yeah. like it just a, Oh, okay. ho hum ending. And, uh, yeah, that's another great uh, point you bring up. Like, I wonder if this, if the woman in black would have been published in the year 2023. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not so sure. Yeah. It's too short to be a novel. Mm -hmm. uh, like I tried to get uh, the Beast of Saint Ender traditionally published, um, and the word count fifty thousand words came up a lot in uh, in requirements for uh, for novels, and yeah, I don't think that this would have been made. I don't think that it would have found an audience. Uh, uh, in the current literary climate. Yeah. Yeah, it's always Which weird to a, me. A shame. Yeah, it's really weird to me when a lot of people talk about book lengths and, and how, you know, even classify something as a novella or what. It's like, it's a story. Like, a story yeah. to me is, I don't know, since I've been writing, one thing I've realized is that the, 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 the story is as long as it needs to be. And that's it. If it's 800 pages, fine. If it's, you know, 50 pages, that's fine too. Um, yeah. Sometimes stretching things out uh, just beyond what they need to be, even with us creating a series or something, sometimes can be the detriment of, of a property, unfortunately. But, yeah, unfortunately, uh, when you're getting traditionally published, yeah, you're at the mercy of the publishers and they're trying to uh, fit you into, I don't know, different categories. However, though, an author that I don't admire but has seen wild success is Martha Wells with the Murderbot Diaries. And she has, those are all very, very short books. So who knows? Maybe the woman in black. I would, I would wager though, that unless she got published by a very small press, that the ending would probably be different. I would imagine if it were published yeah. by, you know, any of the big top five, whatever they are, you know, publishers, but yeah. <clears throat> if this was her first, if like i mean if stephen king came out with a book like this i mean stephen king can do whatever he wants but if this was susan hill's first book and she went i want this weird ending like not a chance yeah dre yeah like maybe if that was her 20th book fine yeah yeah, yeah. do whatever you want with this novella yeah um but yeah, not a chance. I don't think that it, it would have seen any success in 2023. But when you go online, you like uh, it's one of the most popular horror stories uh, in the last well, 40 years. It's 40 years old actually. So um, like it's it's very very popular. It's not very scary, um, but it's just it's dripping. Uh, of uh, gothic atmosphere mm -hmm. and yeah, and uh, cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, is there anything else we wanted to cover on this book, or do we think we got it all? Um, I shall refer to my notes. So <laughs> I actually cleaned these notes up. Uh, scrapped about six pages. And viewers out there, I did not ask him to uh, make <laughs> notes. I said, this is going to be a casual conversation, but here we are. The overprepare. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I guess um, I guess we can talk just a, very briefly, just because they're in my notes. Yeah. So I'm just going to mention it. Like, um, modern sensibilities. Um so dialogue tags um, are nowadays they are name verb right Arthur said um, but in Victorian uh, times uh, people would mix and match 
um, the order of, uh, of those two words um, of the the name and the name and the verb. So you could have like no cried Arthur instead of no Arthur cried. Oh, interesting. And there was no real like um, it wasn't just like one author always did this. You can, in fact, you can find, that's why I brought the other book in the um, Victorian ghost stories. Uh, you can often find like, no cried uh, Mrs. Uh, Swanson. Uh, would you like some tea? Mr. Hansen said. Like, uh, so there was no like, unwritten rule back then mm. i don't think anyway i did notice a pattern of that like um it, it, it almost feels storybookish when you say said so and so said so and so yeah. you know versus saying so and so said um I, I i remember that's it's even in the harry potter books it's the mm -hmm. said so and so so yeah um, it's because i mean we modern readers we associate that uh that sort of dialogue tag with storybook fairy tales mm -hmm. but she's clever susan hill is clever and she knows that if she writes uh o the really authentic old-timey way people are not gonna mm -hmm. be all that interested mm -hmm. so she's clever in that uh like she does use um long sentences for example which is very common in victorian era but she doesn't go o overboard with it mm -hmm. um which is uh, another very smart aspect of it like so you get the feel mm -hmm. you get the feeling that it's um that it's all the timey mm -hmm. but you don't have to like struggle to get right. through it yeah no, I, I, I agree. That's that's a really cool balance because this was written in the 80s. You know, it wasn't written in the, the old yep. time days. And uh, yeah, it's it's always tough to know when you're doing that. And I know I'm sure you struggle with that often is like, well, how how archaic do I get versus how yep. readable do I get? You know, you don't want to alienate the audience, but you also want to be faithful to what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's uh, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, not in this video, uh, <laughs> but like when and of course i write historical fiction you've read my uh, latest four or five chapters yeah uh, a novel set in 1817 uh, the year of mary shelley's frankenstein um and uh, like it's very archaic or at least i think it's very archaic the way i write uh that and the thing is that as soon as you say for instead of uh, instead, mm -hmm. right? Or accept, right? Yeah. When you start to use for as a verb, mm -hmm. basically, uh, no, that's not a verb. Man, what's in this? <laughs> uh, I don't remember the word class. But it, when you when you say, for she had to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. like when you start using that for in that way, uh, like you can't just have that mm -hmm. old timey way of saying for or because. You have to write the entire story with uh, in old timey English uh, or archaic uh, English. It's the same with. Um, uh, a word I have never heard said, but it's E R E. Hair? E R E. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I've never heard anyone say it, but I'm not even sure what it means. Uh, e R E. Because... I feel like there's E R E R R as well, like, like as an error, but. No, but this is, uh, I think it's because. This is embarrassing and stuff we should have looked up beforehand. Um, Good thing we have the internet right here. It means before in okay. time. 
Yeah. I was driven for some half mile ere we stopped. Exactly. If you start using that word, you can't talk about cell phones and, right. you know, internet and, uh, like, Teslas or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, a preposition. You're in it deep. Yeah, so just like for it's yeah. a preposition and... And it's noted as literary and archaic. So, yeah, like you said, mm. no cell phones. Yeah. So, but she's clever. Uh, Susan Hill is clever and she knows that she can use all those words. She can go really, really deep, but she knows that she's writing for a contemporary audience. So, uh, she keeps it very, uh, yeah, she stays away from the, the really deep. Yeah. Uh, from the like the the deep dives but if we look at something like jonathan strange and mr norell um i don't know if you've read that one i haven't but i know of it yeah i've read yeah, piranesi that, right her other book so uh jonathan strange is written as a uh, 19th century pastiche so it is written like very authentic uh and the same goes for well there are lots of books like that. The Enola Holmes books uh, are written like that. Um, but it makes them very, very niche. And not everyone wants to read uh, sort of neo-Victorian writing. Like uh, most people don't. Right. Well, they want it, they, they want it to... And that's I, I did notice that about this book is that it, it did feel like of the time, but it wasn't yeah. difficult to read. I'll bring up Lovecraft again, but his writing is very dense and very just I don't know purple. But and yeah. it's sometimes it's hard to get into because it was written in a certain time, and I'm sure he was trying to emulate his his um, uh, influences as well. But yeah, Susan Hill just definitely manages to create that that just vibe. I can't really <laughs> think of another word. Uh, the atmosphere and just the feeling of reading a book of that time, but then also does not inundate you with a bunch of archaic language, which was a smart choice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Can, of course, say that the first time I read the book mm -hmm. um, and read about a trap, a pony and trap. I didn't know what that was either. I had to look it up. It's a little, a trap. it's a little stumpy buggy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's also a trap, like a trap yeah. that uh, animals get caught in. And for someone, uh, whose, uh, first language is not English that will always trip me up Yeah. just for a second. Yeah. Like what? A trap? Yep. And, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. The carriage. Yeah. We have many words that mean multiple things. And could be spelled the same or not, but may sound the same. So it's, yeah, English is a confusing language, I can imagine, from a non-native speaker. So. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, if, if uh, viewers haven't been uh, scared away by my bad English and weird mannerisms, um, I think... Uh, you should give The Woman in Black a try. Uh, it's cheap as well on Amazon. Yeah, um, I highly recommend it. Like I said, I, I read it too and, and watched the movie to prepare for this thing. And yeah, it's one of those books that um, you just don't see anymore. And, and yeah. it, it kind of, it kind of reminds, reminds me of the, I don't know, the, the, the glory days of, of when often books, you, st you still see them from time to time, but uh, books are less of a were less of a product, and more of you know this is art, this is yeah. trying to say something you know I mean not awkwardly so but it's this is how it was intended to be, and it's not trying to hit some uh, market you know uh, need, whereas yeah. so many novels now are they're just they're like oh well vampires are popular let's yeah we'll hire it. we'll we'll uh, We'll sign these guys because they're writing vampire. Yeah, just yeah. it's lame. I mean, I get it's a business, but this to me reminds me of just that you could tell this was a very important book to Susan Hill. This is the story she wanted to tell to tell a story, not to hit some kind of market or uh, 
publisher need. I just feel like it was uh, somebody, whoever spotted this and greenlit it to be published. Good job. Back in the 80s, yeah. though. It's also like a little bit worrying. Uh, or not worrying, but you have to ask yourself, like, uh, what does it take for a person to write this kind of story? Like, what happened to... And I don't really want to speculate about Susan Hill's private life, <laughs> but you have to, like, whoa. Like, uh, you have to wonder what happened to her that she wants yeah. to write uh, this yeah. uh, very, very powerful, I think, uh, powerful book. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of quotes out there by author, or <clears throat> I shouldn't say authors, but people who are observing authors or writers or artists or anything, and, and they say, like, you know, until you've suffered, you can't make good art in a way. And I know I, I recently read some stuff about Chuck Palahniuk and how he derives things from his real life into his fiction. And he had a really fucked up life. I mean, people are dying in, in just tragic ways and he pulls that into his fiction. So, oh, it's kitty time. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know um, if she pulled this from her imagination. It's almost like when uh, Stephen, everybody says Stephen King's uh, best work is when he was a drunk and a cocaine addict, right? When he was really mm -hmm. just fighting some demons, you know, of addiction. And now he's uh, his stuff's a little bit, you know, I don't know. Not that great, but yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know. <laughs> Trying to censor any cat behinds. Uh, <laughs> I think yeah. that's pretty I'm in her uh, favorite chair at the moment. So oh, she's so she's like, all right. Slightly upset. You've been there long enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, um, I, I don't have anything else to chat about uh, in terms of the book. Do you, is there anything you'll want to mention before you uh, call it? Uh, no. About the novel or the movies? No? Okay. No. Well, why don't, you, why don't you tell everybody uh, where they can find your work? Uh, my work um, can be found. Look at that. Uh, well, I do have a website, matsevanson.com, uh, or you can just go on Amazon and buy my awesome book. It's on Kindle, uh, paperback, uh, and Kindle Unlimited. Yeah, so you can read it for free, well, free-ish if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. Cool, man. Well, uh, I'd love to have you on again. If you have any other books you want to talk about, any like uh, passionate, yeah, any any ones you're extremely passionate about, because I'm I'm excited to talk to people who, because I always like to know what is it about this book that really just worked for you so well. Like, what is it that 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 puts it way up here? And so, yeah, cool chat, man. Thanks for hanging out with me and. Uh, viewers out there uh let us know how you feel about this cat <laughs> and have you read the woman in black um yeah so i guess we'll cut it here yeah, if and... you have if you've read the woman in black and you disagree with me come at me in the comments <laughs> or you can hmm. come at him on my discord server so it's free to join links in the description as well uh he's a very active member there i'm i'm pretty active there too so hope to see you there all right well uh stay tuned for the next episode whenever this thing's gonna happen thanks matt's See Thanks, Jason. Time. Yeah, man.